Hello, are you out there? It's Mark with Redo Over, and we are back to Galsa 4 in depth tutorial. So, we left off very specifically with some mining stations we were trying to get some sensors on. So, I watched the vid, I rewound the tapes, folks, and we definitely got some Starbase modules that should have given us increased sensor range, that should have increased the influence to these, but we can't we can't get them. It's not just mining stations. I also checked on our cultural stations and our economic station down here in the Kratos system. Uh, we got a technology that should have given us modules and we don't have access to them. So this is one of the big fumbles from Stardock. And I don't want to beat anyone over the head right off the bat, but so many, it, it, and I'm not saying that something is broken. I'm just saying, why is it so confusing to me as the player? So I'm someone who's been playing this game off and on pretty heavily for five, six months now. I really dig into it. Obviously, you folks that follow me know how much attention I pay to it. But when I got the technology that should have given us the scanners out to a, a plus 12 or whatever and a plus five more influence on a Starbase module, as well as several other, I think there were six Starbase options. And when I click into our Starbases now, it's been... It's been time. Time has passed. Or, you know, um, <clears throat> we don't have any option to build those modules. So it begs the question, did something go wrong? Maybe those modules are only for a species, a, a civilization of a different type than ours with different traits. That's fine, but Stardock's got to program it so that we're not seeing options that we don't get. Because we're going to go into the research tree over here. We're going to mouse over these options, right? We're going to look at them and say, oh, I want to get disruptor beams. I want to get beam attack plus plus 10. So when I've done that and I exit out, but I don't have access to that new thing or it doesn't do anything for me, then then that's bad. And I shouldn't have to think this much about it or dig into it that much. And, and really my big gripe is that <clears throat> there's so many places within the game where it is this really bizarre little, I, I want to say BS kind of stuff where you're like, okay, well, but what is that? Or how do I get that? Or did I not do that? Shouldn't that have affected this planet? Oh, it didn't. Then then what did I even get for that technology? And um, it's a little bit frustrating. It's a little bit frustrating. Um, I know under some of the ship types <clears throat> in particular, it'll give you a whole bunch of ship bodies that's like, oh yeah, you can now make these. Um, I know some of them are modules that go on to ships, but some of them show up as essentially entire patterns, we'll say. Um, and then later on, you're like, well, I don't see that ship. I don't see the option for that ship. Uh, so I don't know, maybe I'm missing something. I don't know, but it, it is getting old that they haven't ironed out some of these issues, right? So for instance, let's take a look at the Phoenix missile system. We're not going to click it. We're not going to select it, but... If I research the Phoenix missile system, because I'm like, I want Phoenix missiles, I should get the Phoenix missile weapon. This is essentially a weapon you can add if you go into the ship builder, and the game will automatically add it to some of your ships. But also, I want to get the Harpoon Salvo module. Adds a Harpoon Salvo and the ability to attack enemies up to three tiles away. Um... It, am I missing something or is it a module, right? Module effect says the word module effect. I see here that's the Starbase icon. So whereas if I mouse over Phoenix missile, it's a weapon. You notice there's no module option down here, right? So let's go back to Harpoon Salvo. This is clearly a Starbase icon and clearly there's a module effect. But, but what essentially happened is I got six additional module effects but they're not showing up and I cannot add any of those six to my Starbase. That is, um, it, it just shouldn't be there. I mean, that's the point is it just, it, it just shouldn't read wrong and I shouldn't be confused by it. And, and until, until Stardock gets it fixed up, Galsif 4 can't become a popular game. It's a beloved game by me and I think there's a handful of us in the community probably a few hundred of us. But the truth is, if you go on to Steam and you check the Steam charts, you can see how many monthly players there are for any game, every game on Steam. I don't know if you guys know that or not. You can see thousands of games from 10 years ago. You can see there are old games out there that not one person has played 
in the last month. You can also go on there and check an old game like Master of Orion 2 and see that 30 people played it last month, right? That's part of the little community we cater to. So the problem is, is that Gal Civ 4 is not going to grow and is not going to reach thousands of players, let alone tens of thousands. It's just going to dwindle from hundreds to 100 to 50 to 25, and it's going to die. And the reason for that is, is that they made a flawed UI. If, if nothing else is flawed, the UI is. So you just have players frustrated going, oh, didn't I get that? Should, should that be here now? Oh, it's not. Huh, maybe I didn't understand that. And then you just kind of shrug, except the 10th time you play the game, right? Because you're a fan, right? Six months in, a year in, six years from now, you're just going to sit there and you're going to get that frustrated thing where you just shrug and just go, oh, well, that's Gal Civ 4. Just, just weird shit that doesn't work. Just broken stuff that, that makes no sense. It, it's a real shame because it, it, I'll tell you, it comes down to play testing. I mean, I'm going to be blunt with you guys. Play testing is not cheap. You got to pay people to play test. People don't do it for free. Um, and except in the case of like us fans who are playing because we like a lot of parts of the game. But man, I could sure use these little glitchy UI and, 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 and events triggering, but then have no effect or research is being done that then don't trip anything on a planet or a building you put in that then doesn't do what it says on the tin. Just either don't say it, don't put it on the tooltip, or if it's on the tooltip, for the love of goodness, make sure it does what it says. One or the other. I would rather start off just pull some technologies out of the tech tree if they don't do anything or they don't work right. Just, just get rid of it. If you just got to delete 20 technologies out of your 200 tech tech tree, do it, but just make sure the remaining 90% do what they say they do. For the love of goodness. Okay, rant over. If anyone's still with me, let's jump into factions. We talked about factions last time. So we have some pretty useful factions for stuff that we'd be interested in, such as pop growth, right? So you have the Warforge, which is going to essentially let you build military shipyard ships more efficiently at the cost of increased crime. You have the Natural League, which will functionally let you increase growth of pops in exchange for food production. You have the science team that will allow you to have increased science at the expense of manufacturing. And you have the media alliance, which will allow you to grow influence at the expense of diplomatic bonus. Now, there are other factions for other, you know, Xeno civilizations. I know there's one of them that's the inverse of science team. It's like the production team, and it gives you more production at the expense of research. So, yeah, you'll see different stuff. But for us in particular, I think Media Alliance is looking pretty big, and I think Natural League would be pretty interesting to me. And um, if we mouse over, it gives us a quick little update here. It'll say under Media Alliance that influence increases uh, based on member social and diplomacy penalty based on members resolve. Okay, so now we're looking for social and resolve over here. So here's social, and here is resolve. So we want a high green and a low red. High green, low red. Neither of these leaders would be suitable for media alliance. It, it would give us something, but here, let, let's take an ex example of the 7 and 13. Um, you can see they're way out of order, but ultimately, the, the, the higher the social and the lower the resolve, then the higher the influence gain and the lower the detriment to diplomacy. Now, to be fair, that that hit to the diplomacy is a pretty small one tenth of one. So it's it's not bad at all. Here, let's let let's add our other guy in. Oh wow. So look at that pushed that up even higher, our total out output. This is culture output for all of your planets in the galaxy. Right? This is everywhere. This is everyone gets this big 25% bonus with only a minus two to diplomacy bonus. Another interesting thing is that you clearly can see that you can stack up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, possibly even more leaders into these categories. So this is a great place to dump your surplus leaders that you don't know what else to do with. So yeah, that uh, I'm surprised that that's not a bigger hit. Um, now, to be fair, if we pull out both of these leaders, you'll notice that the media alliance with no leadership whatsoever 
still yields us a large plus 16% at only a minus 0.1. Um, so yeah, these are essentially the uh, how well your cultural trait picks align with a given faction. So here the favor is based off of individualism, traditionalism, and progressivism. The higher those go under our culture picks, the, the better impact we get out of Media Alliance. On the other side, we have Warforged. Warforged is benefiting from a touch of totalitarianism, a little bit of nihilism, and a, and a bit of progressivism. So that's how you can see, and that probably magnifies how large these impact numbers are, right? Um, science team relates to progressivism, double progressivism, and traditionalism. And Natural League finally relates to traditionalism, collectivism, and progressivism. So progressivism, progressivism actually seems to have an outsized impact on all the four factions we have access to. You know, again, there may be other factions for other civilizations, but um, interesting thing to note, you know, when you start a new game, you potentially could come in. Um, I don't know if you can see all your factions or if they're grayed out to start, but once your factions pop up, you would definitely potentially want to see what cultural pathways align most significantly with the four factions that are provided to you. Um, yes, food for thought. So let's check the other one. The other one we were particularly interested in was Natural League. This is a pretty good differential. We have plenty of food, but we'd like more growth. So let's see. We'll mouse over here. It's said that the growth will be improved by intelligence, and the food decrease is based on diligence. So this fellow, Neil here, has a massive intelligence and a relatively low diligence. So let's drop this into the Natural League. And we're at a plus 14, minus 4. Okay, that is significant. That plus 14 jumped up 11%, but the food reduction went from a 4 to a 5.6, so 1.5%. So yeah, that's if, if you subtract the 1.5 from the 11, yeah, you're sitting at a 9.5% increase to, to uh, growth there. And again, you can see that barely is going to put a dent in our food production because we just don't care that much about food production. I like that. Um... We'll leave it there for now. We'll just check. Uh, so that was a quick explanation of factions, how they work. Um, you know what I could do? I could take one of our leaders here and drop them in to help us out with our reputation. It's slowly sliding into the negative. Now, you'll notice when you mouse over, it says right down here, reassign, recent assignments will take effect next turn. But eventually what we will see, let's take a look at Jennifer here. She's been the negotiator with the navigators for a while um she's getting a your diplomats make a good case for you right there a solid plus one now i don't know that i've ever seen anything aside from a solid plus one from a, a diplomat i'm a little frustrated with that idea though because in particular jennifer here has a big 12 in social I almost feel like that should give you a bit more than just a single plus one. Let's jump over here to uh, EURN 1864. Their social is only eight, so literally two thirds of what Jennifer's is. But let's mouse over. You can see that your diplomats make a good case for you, plus one. Also, your skill in diplomacy is a plus one. Does everyone have that? What is that? No. No. I wonder if this guy has a uh, some sort of the diplomatic bonus. Inter no, no, it would show up here. You see the icon there; it would show up. So I don't exactly know why this guy is considered a good diplomat. Now let's mouse over real quick. Um, is there a way to see loyalty is your leader? Leader with loyalty below? No, no, no. It's not telling us nothing. Um, here, social modifiers. Leaders' approval and influence. The high social skill is important for diplomats, ministers, colonization, and government. So it says right there that social is important for ministerial positions. However, I'm a little frustrated because clearly this should be giving us more than a plus one. This guy, for whatever reason, is getting a, your skill in diplomacy as well as your diplomats make a good case for you. So why why is this this your getting a plus two total diplomatic bump 
with the Torians where a much higher social creature such as Jennifer is getting a, a just a, a straight plus one. I don't know. I don't know why why that is. That seems like hidden information that is incredibly confusing and opaque. That just doesn't it just doesn't seem right. I, I don't think that's how they should do it, but it is what they're doing. Let's mouse over the others real quickly. Does research affect diplomacy? No. It has to do with Minister of Technology. It's good for governor, good for research. Uh, let's check diligence. Diligence is important for commanders, governors, and manufacturing-based worlds. And finally, resolve is good for military stuff commanders. That's it. So, yeah, uh, makes no sense. It just unfortunately is confusing and, and doesn't seem like it's working right based off of their own tooltips. So, yeah, a lot of venting today, but um, I think we're far enough along now. We're at like 20 five episodes into this we've been doing this for literally four months very dedicated um but we got to call stuff out i mean uh whether star doc fixes gal civ 4 or they're designing gal civ 5 right now they need to not have these 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 mysterious incorrect seeming numbers in these tooltips that describe things that don't actually happen and are not actually reflected in the game it's it's bad mojo folks um, so, and then one other thing I thought I would take a quick look at with you folks is under the trade routes, we've never really looked at this, but this is worth looking at. So I've talked many times about how I don't like to manage trade routes. I don't want to go from every planet like Earth, Kratos 5, Kratos 4, Alula Borealis 3, and then send a trade ship out to every other planet in the galaxy. Well, guess what? You don't actually have the ability to do that. You do have a certain number of trade licenses currently. We could have up to 10 trade licenses. We are using three. How can we tell that? Because the outbound arrows here, this gold or, or orange with the out, we have from Earth to Toria, an additional from Earth to Toria, as well as a Kratos 5 to Toria. Now, we could add seven more trade routes from any of our planets to any other planet, essentially, any place that has a shipyard. Couple things to, to look at. Um, the trade routes work in both directions. So let's look at the example of Earth here because it, it has an incoming and an outgoing. So the Torians sent their trade ship to us. You can see that our relations are hateful. That impacts how much trade we do. It really kind of restricts it, unfortunately. This could be much more lucrative, but the Torians really don't like us. Um, the tr total trade route value is 6.9 credits, we'll say, right? The length of it is that a plus one adds a plus one value. I'm assuming a longer length is better for trade routes at least. Uh, so in route route age is a plus five. So that means as time goes by, the longer you can keep those trade routes active, that number is going to climb and climb. And finally, trade planet incomes. So it's probably taking some average or some calculation of Toria's uh, Earth and, and Toria's trade uh or incomes not trade incomes um trade planet incomes okay so on the other side of that let's look at our earth tutorial so this is us to them you can see here again the relations come in trade route value is more considerable here and what you're going to notice is we're getting a plus 33 percent because we are the initiator otherwise the numbers are the same so the only reason that we're making less from the Torian trade route coming in than our trade route from us to Toria is that we initiated this one, they initiated this one. So on their side, they would see that plus 33% and it would probably give them a value of around 9.1. Now, for whatever reason, we sent not one, but two trade ships to Toria. However, you can clearly see here, this one's not yielding the same value. And if I had to guess, that would be because the age of the root is younger. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, that's the only difference I can see. So there you go. And then what else do we have? We have a from Kratos to Toria as well. It's hateful. The Kratos star base, though, you can see that economic star base we built in the Kratos system is in fact giving us a plus 10%. Uh, and it seems to be adding a plus one to the root length somehow and a plus five to the root age no what am i what am i missing there hold on hold on 
oh, maybe all it's doing, maybe the Kratos star base is just giving the 10%, everything else is the same. I'm looking at how it's indented right here, these indents, but it's possible that these are not a subcategory of the Kratos 2 star base. I think this Kratos 2 star base stands by itself, yielding that 10%. Otherwise, these three values down here are the same as they would be right here. Length, age, root. Yeah, that's what's going on. Um, and then Arnor is coming in. They're unfriendly with us. So probably that means we're getting a little bit more bonus potentially than the one from Toria who hates us. Or mm, I know with some of like the cultures like pacifists, I believe they receive little bonuses when you are friendly with Xenos versus, you know, uh, we'll say neutral or hateful or uh, unfriendly. So that might be where you're seeing that value. It's just like uh, maybe it doesn't actually affect the credits. I, I could be wrong. But again, um, they're not telling us, right? When, when we... We mouse over relations and unfriendly. It gives no other information beyond which none of these values seem to say the words relations or have any gauge of friendliness. So I'm not sure if, if your relationship status impacts how well trade works. And so all together, you're going, well, okay, well, we've looked at the trade breakdown tab. I mean, bear in mind, there's only like, what, uh, 10 tabs down here, right? So to click in there, you know, it's the first time we've ever looked at it. And is it worth it? Is it worth it? You come in and you say, well, total trade income per turn, 50? That's pretty good. That's a big chunk. I mean, hey, look at We're only making a plus 40 per turn right now. So if it weren't for that 50, we'd be negative 10. Well, not so fast. It's not, it's not as good as that, unfortunately. If we come down to Civilization tab, over here, we get the breakdown of our revenues our expenses, and our net monthly income. That's how much surplus, that's how much goes into the piggy bank. So look at this. Your GDP, this is all your planets, all your stations is right there, added with your trade route income. There's the plus 50. That's 49.56. They round up to 50. Those are added and then multiplied by 25% or 0 0.0125. That yields 156.13. I did the math. So here is the big big bummer. We are not making 50 credits. We are only, we're, we're making 12 and a half. <laughs> we're, we're getting 25% of that 50. So when you think of all of the trouble involved in making a, 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 a transport ship, sending it off to the right planet and having that and maintaining it, it's not the end of the world, but it's only giving you a quarter to maybe a third of the value coming in. I would be ecstatic if we were making 50 credits off of this. We're not. We're making 12 and a half, and that's pathetic. I, I It's just, it's not, it, it's it's something, but it's just like, okay, that is why I don't do trade routes, folks. That's why I don't do trade routes. Because unless you're doing a trade build where you're getting big bonuses, big ups, ups to that, it's just kind of like shrug. It's just a shrug, you know? Uh, I, if, you, if you took away that trade right now and took away 12 and a half from this, we'd still be to sit at plus 27 credits. So so no, this isn't particularly useful. I do personally think we should get that entire trade route income after taxes. I don't think taxes should affect it. I would say the trade route income is taken by the government, by the civilization right off the top. It does not, in fact, re represent gross domestic product coming in through the citizens and what they're making and, and, and selling. Uh, I think trade income should be like a fat off the top, in my opinion. And then, I and I'm not saying that because I know anything about economics. I'm saying that because then, then maybe if I was making 50 instead of 12 and a half, I'd consider it worth it. But uh, yeah, so that's all the stuff I wanted to talk about. Let's run through some events and press the game forward here. The Nanite Worship Maker. Our flagship has discovered an artifact from an unknown long gone civilization. Inside, we find sophisticated nanites capable of assembling a powerful automated worship. Do we harness this power or we do we disassemble it for process? So, yeah, let's see. We can get a charge of a uh, worship or we could harvest it for 150 treasury. Now, nah, let's grab the worship. That'll be fun. Now, down here under in our vault, we have um, this artifact that'll spawn an overlord ship. Now, it's important to realize that you could just cash this in immediately. We just click it, 
and we put it where we want it so we could say, uh, well, here, let's, let's try and set it somewhere way out here. Let's see if we can set it next to our fleet here. Uh, here we go, right there. Yes, check that out. So here, let's look, look at the ship real quickly. It's a 48 cruiser. Um, yeah, yeah, not a bad ship. I mean, in, in, in an emergency, that's a nice ship. Let's join it in with our fleet. Why not? Uh, that'll just make them more survivable. But here's the real trick. You don't necessarily want to cash in those warships. If you were to have a little piggy bank, a little stack of, you know, nano fighters and nano, you know, cruisers like that, you may want to save them for when a war breaks out because of the fact that you can click on the tile, uh, the, you know, the chip a medallion and then land it anywhere you want, even in enemy controlled space means you could either supply an existing fleet that was in threat of annihilation or surprise attack the enemy by essentially materializing several nano ships right on top of them. You know, if you had three or four of those little ship top tokens of whatever variety, you can make a sizable or, you know, partially formidable little fleet anywhere you need it. Or if you were being attacked at a far flung starbase or planet and all your fleets were turns and turns away, you could reinforce the, the defense of that world or that starbase immediately by deploying your, your nanite swarm. So sometimes keeping them here in your vault for emergency use is, is a smart call. But in this case, I don't think there's any real threat to us, so we will just summon them and advance the turn. Well, whoa, our flagship discovered another nanite warship? What the what? Okay, that's cool. Here, let's uh, put them in with our other far-flung scout ship. Here we go. So we'll spawn another overlord ship. That's another cruiser called the Paladin. We'll join up. And what do we got? Ships idle, perfect. Uh, not for long. Let's have them, uh, yeah, let's go steal some technologies from Xenos. They're not getting them, so we might as well get them. Let's look under our executive orders. Yeah, we could draft colonists. Jeez. Drafting colonists is always a nice, uh, executive order to give because it doesn't actually, as far as I'm aware, take a citizen out of, out of, a, one of your worlds. It doesn't pluck a population away. Like when you build a star, when you build a colony ship at a star base, it will, you'll load it with a colonist. But when you draft colonists, you're essentially just choosing from a, we'll say a big pool, a lottery. You're taking a couple people here, a couple people there from all over your world, and that's how you're getting the colonists. So it doesn't actually remove an entire citizen. But if we come up to our planets tab and we scroll down, we can clearly see that below our colonies here, there's not even a single uninhabited world. So that will sit and is not really useful to us. So let's go to ship idle. What else we got here? Where are you, right in the middle? Yeah, there we go. So here's another one of our flag fleets and they need something to survey. We are rapidly, rapidly running out of things to survey here. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, we'll send them to the south. Maybe one of our upcoming technologies that we research, we will want to unlock additional anomalies. We have so many great flagship groups going that we might as well stay on top of anomaly uh, research and capture ship idol this is the vanguard where is she sit oh yeah vanguard no no what, what am i missing here guys why, why can't i see the vanguard gosh darn, i struggle so hard to see these damn ships oh here god okay there you go um it's another cruiser do we need to do anything with it? I'll tell you what we should probably consider is starting to reinforce each one of our shipyards with a decent warship to help defend it. Because when you're trying to take over an enemy, the first thing you do before you invade that colony, that world with your siege ships or your troop transports is you destroy their shipyard. You destroy the shipyard, it keeps them from making new warships and it's highly effective. So we should at least lightly defend every shipyard we have. Um, I do see another freighter fleet right here completed. So this is coming out of, who are you out of? Kratos 2, right there. Or, or maybe Kratos 1? Shoot. Uh, oh yeah, it is Kratos 1, because that shipyard belongs to Kratos 2. All right, so here's a Kratos 1. So let's uh, send it far, far afield to a cool Navigator homeworld um, right there. Aniara 2. It'll take them Seven more turns together, but that's fine. Uh, ship idle. 
we have a cruiser. This is a beefy 73 health cruiser. Now you've noticed we've been making some cruisers and they've been popping out with 48 health, like our nanite swarms and some of our other cruisers, like the one we just parked down here at the shipyard in Kratos 5. If we click on that, we can see that's a cruiser with 48 hit points. And what's the difference? The difference is this is Iconia. And Iconia gets all sorts of mad bonuses. So for instance, it's the Orbital Academy Military Improvement. I just happened to click on that one first. Thank goodness. It's giving a plus 50% to all hit points from all ships built out of this shipyard. So that's permanent though. You can see that that is just one massive monster ship. And if we mouse over here, um, I'm on the, the tile for the Vanguard. I mouse over the hit points. You can see the experimental drives. That is one of our um, policies. Is it a minus 20 to hit hit points? The minister position, the minister of defense, I think is giving a plus 16% to hit points. The orbital academy, which is here on Iconia, is yielding us the plus 50%. And uh, medium hull size yields a plus 50%. Obviously, a smaller hull size might only yield a, a 10 or a 20 or, you know, whatever. I don't I don't usually look at that too much. But, um, yeah, that's that's beefy. That is actually really nice. Um, what should we do with that ship? Let's go reinforce an additional shipyard. Yeah. Let's make sure that every shipyard has at least one defending ship. We'll advance the turn. Oh, my gosh. It's so hard to advance the turn. There's just so much shit going on. Ship idle. Who's idle? Another freighter? All right, this freighter's out of Earth, so yeah, we got to send it far, far afield. Now, bear in mind, again, we will eventually run out of total trade licenses, but we, I think we are going to be sitting at around five or six used based off the number of freighters we've sent out. Maybe even we might go to seven at this point. But yeah, let's head to, how do you say that? Gwen Hayfair? Sure. Uh, No, no, we don't want to attack him. What the funk, Alicious? Back to Earth. That is a freighter. That's a cargo freighter. And we're going to jump back over and try one more time. Yeah, I'm trying to spread our trade routes around. There you go. And uh, that trade route ship will be there probably in also about seven minutes. So a new research completed, Warp Theory. Having observed the effects of hyperdrive for some time now, our physicists believe a new, more advanced form of propulsion can be developed based on a principle of nested hyperspace bubbles in a system called warping. So... That is going to net us the warp drive, which is a module for ships. The gravity field generator, which should be um, a module to go on a star base. Well, we will see. <laughs> it would affect movement cost in our favor. The slipstream generator, also meant to go on a star base. This would affect movement cost against the enemy's favor. It would slow them down and increase our tactical speed. By the way, tactical speed is in the combat window, if I'm not mistaken. It's like in combat speed versus, uh, you know, uh, what is the other one? Just move cost. And finally, it did, does give us an immediate and automatic plus one movement to all ships of all kinds. Even without refit, that will work. We want to choose a new tech. So listen, we've got tons of great one turn options because our research is sitting pretty fat right now. I'm pretty pleased. You can see over even Colonial Refit is sitting at one. Starbase Com Stack, Mining Missions. Let's look at the Starbase Com Stack real quick. I think I, there's Sector Scanners. See, that's the one we want. That's what we want. We want that. Is, oh man, it, did they edit something out? So remember, if, if you guys go back to the last episode and you, you scroll back in there, maybe like, you know, 10 minutes back into that episode from the end, you will find the technology that gave us six varieties of scanners. One of them, I think, was maybe this exact one, or maybe it was sensor power plus 12, influence growth plus five. But I think that they edited out that technology. I think that it's an artifact from an earlier copy of the game and that you don't actually get to get that technology. That's what I think is going on. It's it's a it's a wart they need to remove. Um, interstellar collectors. That's a manufacturing bonus for one of our uh, economic worlds. And I would I would be willing to do that. I mean, the plus three maintenance is a big hit, but plus four manufacturing. Yeah, we may want to dump this onto uh, the Kratos system economic starbase. And then finally, interstellar collectors. Whoa, more manufacturing. What? Whoa, whoa, whoa. am I reading that right? Okay. 
Interstellar Collectors, right there. Oh, hold on. Where, where the hell were we? Here, let's, let's make sure we're, we're reading this right. Interstellar Collectors, plus for manufacturing. Now, let's go to support field stabilization. Oh, no. I was I was mismousing. That's what happened. Yeah, see, see how when I move the mouse between these, it doesn't reassert. Yeah. So, so that is what we'd like, though, potentially, is that Interstellar Collectors on our Economic Star Basic Kratos, yes, for the plus four manufacturing. The other one is sector scanners at a plus 16 instead of a plus 8 or a plus 12. Theoretically, we should get that on our star bases if we do it. Question? Question mark? Yeah. I'm willing to bite the bullet and find out here pretty shortly. But the other thing I was really interested in was which one of these would allow us to research additional Xeno artifacts. So here I see Xeno resource extraction down there. Allows us to further develop exotic resources from our core worlds. Okay. Anything else? Refits, regenerative, political capital, cultural trade packs. Starbase, mighty missions, flexible bulkheads. Bulkheads, beams, pulse iron, improved. Oh, wow. So there's not a lot else. It's possible the Xeno resource mining would get us to the next level of scanners. It's possible it wouldn't, though. So I don't really know. What about over here? Fleet resupply. Nah, it's not going to do nothing. And biomass, whatever the fudge, that ain't going to do nothing. Maybe we should go for the Starbase comm stack. I want to see if we get these sector scanners. Let's do it. It's one turn away. We'll have it in no time. This is the Kratos 2 shipyard. Fantastic. Um, geez, I think we're sitting pretty good now, folks. We've got quite a few freighters out there. We've got quite a fleet built up. I, I don't think we need any more constructors right now. Most... Most of the rest of the sectors of the galaxy are in someone else's Zoc or zone of control. You cannot put a constructor in a zone of control of, an, of another species. You could put it in your own zone of control or in uncontrolled space, meaning air quotes, uh, empty space. So let's get some uh, let's get some supply ships going. Let's build two of those and then maybe two production modules. We haven't uh, added to our module count in a little bit now, so we'll hit done. And we have another shipyard idol. This is Icos. Oh my gosh, these guys make stuff so fast. What are we doing here? It's all good. Um, we could just make supply ship after supply ship after supply ship, which would be a little bit hilarious. But let's uh, let's reverse this around. Let's do two production modules, and then let's do four supply ships. That'll keep them out of our hair for just a little while. Ship idol, who are you? Another cargo freighter coming out of Kratos 4. Very cool. Let's find some new Xenos to uh, visit with. Let's say, uh, which one? Argena 4, on the way. And we'll, oh, another ship idle. Who do we got here? Yet another freighter coming out of Kratos 2. This is perfect. Listen, this is going to max out. I would imagine this is going to max out our trade licenses pretty shortly here. But let's have this one go to Hilnor 2. Perfect. We advance the turn. Anomaly already being surveyed. Where? What? 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 What, um, what person's already being surveyed? Where? What? Did, did it tell us who? <laughs> uh, I wonder if there's a, like an idle ship icon, maybe? Hive base is sitting there. The Taurus fleet seems to be scanning right now. Two months re remaining. Yeah, two months remaining, two months remaining. Obviously, we have some fleets that could have ships tucked away inside of them. It's hard to say, but I'm just scanning. I'm doing a real quick visual scan. Oh, here we go. These guys are, are done. Here's, here's the Libertas fleet finished with their scanning and now has nothing to do. So, oh, it's because these guys, these Altarans beat us there. So Altarans are on a, I, I, I guess I want to say on on par with us at the same the same tier as us potentially but yeah let's jump down here and grab this capsule and then we'll sweep across the southern portion hitting several of these on the way to kind of the heart of festron territory the festron does seem to be quite behind in harvesting uh anomalies and cargo capsules and all that kind of crud so ship idle another freighter oh my god we got to stop making freighters folks we're, we're going to just run out of trade licenses. I don't know what to say. Let's send that freighter over here to Titus is at 5.3 coin. Titus 4 is at 1 coin. Oh my God, that's horrible. Chara, 
Yeah, no. The Deep, no. 1.5 from Tolomon. How about Pearl? No, it's at 4. Toria, 6.5. We already have two trade deals with Toria, so I don't want to go back to that well again. Let's jump back over to the Navigators. Are we here? here. Yeah, so 1.9 for Hilnor 2. Not impressive. In a Car Carid Caridia? Yeah. Ah, crap. I feel like we we were kind of hitting all the good worlds because this is Earth again. Have we already sent an Earth trade ship to Caridia? Possibly. I don't know. But there's another one. There you go. The turn just flopped around. Here's the research complete. Starbase comm stack. Few people consider the sheer amount of communication and logistical communi coordination required to maintain our civilization as it spreads across the stars. This improved communication stack will make all that work easier. So specifically, we are looking for the sector scanner that's sitting at a plus 16 sensor power. Let's see if we get it. Oh my, there it is. Greater anomaly detection, discover new anomalies in the universe. We want that. One turn away and that's going to hopefully reveal many, many more anomalies for us. But before we get to that turn, we're almost ready to switch over. We got to take care of a culture pick and we want to come in here to our mining station. Oh, oh, there we go. Sector scanner. Perfect. Click that on. That's an extra five. And there's a surveillance system. Was that not there before? Holy shit. And a thulium sensory. What, what, what's going on? Wait, wait, did I do that on the wrong star base? I might've. <laughs> my, my bad. Um, hold on. Oh gosh. Oh wow. Yeah, should we just do these up? As long as there's not a um, uh, there's not a tax on them, right? Um, we might as well upgrade them. Do any of the others? I don't think so. I'm just looking real quick, seeing if there's any other ways to improve influence off of these. And no, I'm not seeing it. Okay, so. Let's back out. That's starting from right here. We then jump over to here. We are going to get their scanners. So again, we're trying to make a mesh of influence growth. I know this is very tepid. It's, it's a very small amount of influence growth. But the sooner we can flip these damn Torians on their backs, their little turtle shell backs, the sooner we can scoop them out of their turtle shell and eat them. I think we can all agree that's a, a really good idea. This is one of our culture star bases, but yeah, I'm grabbing those up as well. Oh, and there's a cultural exchange. Yes, please. We have six modules left. Let's jump right up here to this mining station. Boom. Boom. And a thulium sensor. Boom. Okay. And we can get one more here. Is that ours? Yes, that is. Oh my God. That's like way deep in their territory here i'm just i'm just looking you can see we have them surrounded look we have star bases here here up at the top two of them we have this here 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 oh, sorry here 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 and here here is this us it is us oh my gosh so we have them just surrounded oh and we have a cultural star base right here can we get scanners on that yes we can Oh my gosh, that's the right way to do that. Because that is, that's uh, leaning into these two planets real quick. Titus 1 is sitting at, um, Rebellion's at 15%, and Titus 4 is at 7%. We got a long ways to go. But um, listen, that's all of our modules, but we got upgrades through most of this. I think there's a, a couple others, like here and here we could upgrade. Let's just take a look here at our shipyards. We have a couple idols. Constructor coming, supply ship, production module, production module. Wait, let's have everyone jump on production modules real quick. Let's just slam out a couple sets of those. And who else? Who else right here? Alula. Yeah, we'll have them work on two of those. Boom, boom. All right. So we'll have a dozen more production modules here within just a few more turns. And we can finish working on these other mining stations. Uh, again, we're trying to just crush their influence. But here we go. Cultural progression. Where are we sitting with this? Are we working on individualism? Yeah. Yeah, we are. We got 71 culture points. And I'm looking here. We've got all these, our research done, done. We are to this level here. Competitiveness or self-governance. 
One of those two will then unlock the sovereign identity at the end. So which of these two for the time being? All citizens who have the individual's trait now provide plus one raw wealth to their core worlds. That's input, not output, right? That's going to come in and then get worked on and they get spit out. So the question is how many citizens are individualists? You can see up here, 13% of our citizens have the flag of individualists. So it's not a bad thing or the other one's self-governance plus 8% approval to all core worlds except your home world and plus one leader. Is that useful? Maybe here, let's pop out. Let's jump over civilization. And you can see here our average approval for all of our worlds is sitting at 91%. That's pretty good. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, do our worlds need to be made any happier? Here, let's sort. Alula is at the top with 96%. And we'll click again to reverse. Kratos 2 is at the bottom at 82%. Yeah. Let's go for it. The reason for that is, is again, approval affects approval. Any any approval below 100% is cutting into your manufacturing and your research per turn. So I think it would be well worth all these worlds, all these core worlds minus, uh, well, Earth maybe and possibly Iconia. But I would say we still have one, two, three, four, five, five or six of our core worlds should benefit from that 8%. So let's just see what happens. We'll jump in. We will take self-governance. We'll say yes. And in particular, I don't feel that we need more raw wealth right now. It's just not that important. We have a bunch of trade ships that are going to boost up our, our wealth quite a bit anyway. So for the time being, competitors can wait. But there you go, self-governance. So now with that plus 8%, let's sort again. Boom, boom. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Kratos was at 82. They're now at 90. So that worked. That was exactly, exactly 8%. Uh, let's sort again, back to the top. Alula did not improve though. You can see that Alula was at 96, I believe, and they're still at 96. They're stuck there. I don't, I, I've noticed actually that no matter what you do on any world with any culture, no matter any leader, I don't think you can get your approval above 96% that I've seen. We'll pay attention to that in the games to come, but I think 96 is the cap. I don't know, may, maybe I've seen like a 98, but I've never seen even a 99 or 100. I can promise you that. And that's playing a lot of games. 94 here, Earth at 92, Kratos at 90. Hey, that's great. I mean, uh, what that means, honestly, is that we're sitting really fat with the waste here. You can see right up at the top of manufacturing, there's that times 96%. So that's essentially saying times 0.96 to everything else. And the same is true with research. So yeah, you know, um, hopefully it'll be well worth it with time. Um, all right, what else do we got? Let's go back to our executive orders. Forced overtime, I'm not really so interested in that. We're drafting civilian ships. We have plenty of warships. We don't need the telescope takeover and we don't need to print money. Everything's sitting pretty, pretty, but we did gain one new leader, if you recall. Um, here is... Tali Moda, so uh, our cultural pick just got us one new leader. She increases individualism ideology. That's cool. I don't mind that. And plus three social, plus two persuasion. Yeah, she's a pretty well-rounded leader. Um, I don't know that there's anything she'd be particularly great at, right? She, she's not going to slot into any of these. It's way, way too competitive. Uh, any governor slots she can move into? She would make a decent governor. Like if, if we found a new world, that 13 social sits very nice. Um, I could almost see her like replacing Jenna. I know we've had this conversation so many times. Jenna seven sucks, but her 15 research and 13 diligence are massive, even compared to like uh, T Tali there. So yeah, you know what? We'll, we'll let it sit. There's no need to rock the boat. Um, we'll keep her in reserve. We could put her in as a diplomat. Here, let's scan real quick. Remember we put in WIJH a couple turns ago? Let's just mouse over. Your diplomats make a good case for you, plus two. Wow. Jeez, he's, he's doing a great job there as a diplomat. I find that fascinating. I don't, I don't know why that works, but it does. Okay. So you remember this was in a negative two red arrow. The Altarians were sliding into the negative at minus two darts or arrows. They're only sliding at minus one now. And that's probably because WIJH is being such an effective uh, diplomat with plus two on the diplomacy. 
So the other thing that may be worth looking at over here on the faction side, would we drop in Tali anywhere? Would, would Tali be suitable in one of these spots? Um, here, we'll just drop her in everywhere. You can see there that's red-green, so red-green. Um, drop her in here. Blue, eight. You want your top number to be the superior one, so we would want this to be higher than this in these cases. Over here, that research versus uh, the diligence wearing away from production. So let's see here, let's move it back over. So yeah, our production is taking almost a 1% hit, but you're gaining 2.5% to science. So you know, that's you know what it is. And then finally, over here. So just so you know, when I'm doing this with the leaders, when I take a leader and I drop them into each category, I'm looking for these two numbers that show up to be as far apart as possible in the beneficial direction. So over here in Warforged, I would want a high resolve with a near zero in social skills. Some leaders, FYI, are so crappy that they can have negligent numbers. Uh, you look down here, um, Maremba has a resolve of two. So if you had a faction where resolve was the negative trait, but diligence or intelligence was the positive trait, you would have a massive differential. She could be potentially a great leader, depending on what the faction is, is looking for. Um, so yeah, factions mix it up in all different ways. And bear in mind, although there's the four traits, uh, intelligence, social, diligence, and resolve, they can be mixed together in different ways, where you may want a high social here, or you might want a low social here. So they, they can alternate back and forth. I how many total combinations would that be? Um, oh gosh, I'm so, <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying to think you could, you could do, um, four times three combinations. Is that correct? I think so. I think so. So I think there'd be 12 combinations of blue, green, purple, and red that you could drop into these. However, I think you have to double that number because you could invert the values. You could, you know, um, so say here you had a blue, purple, so for, for example, you could do blue, green, blue, purple, blue, red. That's three options. But then you could also do green, purple. That's there. Green, red. That takes us to five. And then the final option would be purple, purple, red. So that takes us to six options. So I, I was wrong about it. It's six total ways to do it. However, you would then double that because you could have it where purple should be high and red should be low or with the same colors, Red should be high, purple should be low. So in that sense, if, if I'm doing this right, if I'm thinking about this right, there's six ways to combine the colors, but there's two ways to have the colors be valued. So it's 12 total uh, types of factions values you could have. So yeah, there's a lot to do with it. Um, now granted, you only will ever get four combinations of faction. Uh, does that mean there are 12 total factions in the game? I don't know. There may be more, than, there may be less than that. I've never paid that close of attention. But, you know, uh, when you have time, uh, you folks can sort through it for your playthrough. So for the time being, let's, uh, yeah, let's dump her over here. Let's get that social media uh, presence going. Uh, remember, if we do need another governor for some reason, we may pluck her out of that position. And I think she'd make an excellent governor. But here we go. A new event popping up. Situation report. Diplomat's Dilemma. So... A-N-K-D, your esteemed career diplomat has come across a highly sensitive and classified file that could potentially cause a diplomatic crisis among several species in the galaxy. The information in the file could be used to gain a significant advantage in negotiations, but could also lead to unrest and mistrust if discovered. So, A-N-K-D is torn between using the knowledge for your civilization's benefit and staying true to their principles of diplomacy and integrity. They have come to you for guidance on how to handle this delicate situation. We have two options, folks. Use the information. This will lead to a minus five loyalty for ANKD, but will lead to plus one diplomatic bonus to all units for 50 months. I, I assume that would mean all of our diplomats would get a plus one. Not bad. Or preserve diplomatic integrity. A plus five loyalty to our diplomat, but no bonus now, I do wonder, though, it doesn't say, is it possible if we if we preserve diplomatic uh, integrity, some other outcome could pop up later? I don't know. 
I, I'm almost willing to hurt A, a and KD's rep, uh, loyalty with this. I don't really care that much. I want the diplomacy bonus, so let's use the information. Let's jump back in real quick. Let's jump over to our diplomats. And... Where is he? Where did where'd he go? Here. Oh. Okay, well, he's not really being diplomatic, but okay. So he was at a 91, obviously, in loyalty, so... That's fine. He took a big hit, but I honestly don't think your minister's loyalty affects the outputs you get out of them in any way. So I, I think he could be all the way down to like a 25 loyalty in the red and it wouldn't really matter. Where loyalty matters, as far as I know, with your leaders is in governor positions. The higher the loyalty here, the happier the people on the planet are. Um, so it's worth keeping an eye out for Harmony Crystals. And in particular, you want to invest your Harmony Crystals in these leaders. You want to get these boosted up well into the green range, and it will make your people all the happier. Uh, I still have three more Harmony Crystals. Let's see, for Diplomats, does it matter? Eh, I don't know. Honestly, um, I can see Skill and Diplomacy is at a plus one, and Diplomat makes a good case is at a plus one. So I don't think loyalty affects Diplomacy, as far as I'm aware. Commanders? Uh, I don't know. I have sorted a bit through the diplomacy tab. We're probably going to want to look at it more thoroughly. Is there a way to get a commander from a Xeno species to come over with their flagship and join your side? I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, I could imagine a low loyalty leader in charge of a flagship could be coerced into joining your side. But I haven't had that done to me, nor have I seen a way to do it to others. And finally, I don't believe loyalty matters for factions in the slightest. So, yeah, there you go. The only place I think loyalty matters, in summary, is possibly for commanders and definitely for governors. Otherwise, I don't think it matters for your diplomats, your factions, or your ministers. So, FYI. Now, we've got a couple of ships idle. What do we have here? Another freighter. Oh, my God. Here, we, we need to stop on the freighters. Oh, my gosh. That's enough. I'm going to stop that. We have way too many freighters going on. We're going to run out of licenses. So since that's going on, let's uh, get some more supply ships. I will load that up. Remember, we're putting out a supply ship every turn. I hope that wasn't too loud for you guys. That seemed very loud. Um, <laughs> I like to have a little bit of background music and sound effects so it kind of livens up when I'm not talking, which is almost all the time. But um, yeah. Hopefully the sound effects are never too loud. Let me know in comments if it's ever a problem. But here we go. Kratos 4 sending off another freighter. Let's dump this thing way into Altarian space here. Yeah, let's dump it at Talana 3. There you go. Ship idle. This is one of our flagship squadrons. And let's find some more junk to research. Um way, way deep into Altarian territory. I don't think there's anything they can do about it. Um, oh, and that's interesting. You, you see how we're actually ex, ex, uh, revealing these hexed off, these, these blank areas. We have not revealed this, and presumably this whole back section we've never looked at. Fascinating. Okay, well, we will we will send our, our scouts out there as time permits. Another ship idle? Oh, way over here on the edge. Fantastic. Um, this is one of our smaller research crews. A very small fleet. Not very powerful. Um, let's send them... Where? Ooh, we don't have another fleet up here? Oh, we're sending them out. Okay, no problem. We're going to send them up to here first to research that anomaly. When they're done with that, we will return them down here to research this anomaly. In the meantime... Shit. I'm hoping they don't attack us. Oh, crap. Their sensor range is two. It's possible that these, these um, Fire Thea creatures can only see two hexes away. Certainly, we can outrun them. Their move is only three, so if necessary, I'm, I'm sh our move is 13. We'll be able to get away, but uh, we'll have to pay attention and see what happens there. Here's an event. This is coming from the Victory. Artifact cache. Your flagship locates a hidden cache of precursor artifacts left behind by the ancient civilization. These artifacts are not only valuable, but also hold clues to the advanced technologies of the precursors. Fantastic. 
So we can extract a Drantium or add it to the Vault and gain a charge of Inspire Scientist. Uh, yeah, it's questionable. Um, we got plenty of Durantium though, so let's grab it. We're going to grab the charge and essentially it would just dump 50 research in. Until we get to a technology that is more than one month, it's not worth using. But uh, yeah, we'll just bank it for now. No reason not to have that in the piggy bank. And another event here. Stargazer survey report. Ancient star map. Your flagship discovers an ancient star map etched onto the surface of a seemingly insignificant moon. The map reveals that there is a very valuable planet relatively close to our current location. Oh, oh my gosh, where's the stargazer? So here's the trick with these folks. Uh, this is going to reveal an amazing level planet. However, if the stargazer, when it says relatively close to your current location, that means the stargazer, not Earth. <laughs> so if the stargazer is open in Altarian space, there's a really good chance the Altarians are going to grab it. Now, we can decide later, but here's the problem. There's no option to decline. So we are just going to create a new world right now. That being said, where's the Stargazer? Which one of these guys is the Stargazer? Stargazer, right there. Okay, where's the planet? We can visually look for it, or we can scroll down. There it is. Alula, oh, nice. Alula Borealis 1. Oh my goodness. We're going to have three. Look at that little world that used to be dead. The jewel of the universe. Fantastic, you guys. And look, we're going to have three great worlds all in orbit around this one star here, Alula Borealis. This system might need to get an economic star base going eventually. All right, so two ways we could do this. We could jump into one of these two star bases and hurry the production of a colony ship. Granted, that would pluck a population off of one of the two planets or... If you recall, we do have a draft colonist available. Let's give the order. There you go. And if I'm not mistaken, they always pop out at your home world. So here's Earth. There's the colony ship. And her move is 17, so she is quick, quick. We're going to send her cruising right on over to Alula. I don't think the Torians will be able to get anything there ahead of us by next turn. That'll be our world. And we'll probably take that leader we have um yeah we'll probably take uh tolly and drop her in there let's see which who's who's the better leader yeah neil's social's way low tolly's social yeah tolly's gonna be the new governor of that world it's gonna be great so we'll advance the turn folks see our ships scooting around everywhere let's let's watch oh, oh uh, i wanted to watch the line of uh influence there another freighter here we got to make sure we've cleared out freighters i don't want any more freighters going holy cows Please, no more freighters. Okay, looks like the freighters are all wrapped. So this is another Earth-bound freighter. Awesome. Um, again, we're gonna we're gonna run out of. Um, oh, we have one to Arnor already. Oh, here we go. Agena. Oh, well, they're gonna flip soon. Yeah, let's send it to Agena. Why not? Um, uh, yeah, is that how you say it? Agena. Okay. Research complete. Greater anomaly detection. The discovery of a fresh anomaly is one of the most exciting and pivotal moments a civilization can experience. We should redouble our efforts to find more boons. We gain the uh, Titanic Eye Sensor. Uh, that is a ship module. Uh, okay, very cool. It, it gives your ship a really massive sensor suite. Um, okay. This will unlock Slipstream Drive eventually. Let's choose a new tech. So where are we at here? I don't think anything is too pressing. We got our anomaly detection uh, sorted out, which is good. We want to stay on top of our anomalies. Uh, what else? What else is there? Uh, mining missions, which uh, I despise. I don't want to do. Uh, colonial capital refit improves the quality of our worlds and theoretically unlocks a megalopolis. Urban plan and policy with a plus one cap to probably all your core worlds not bad uh, otherwise xeno resource mining planetary invasion i don't really care about that kind of stuff yeah let's uh, let's grab that colonial capital refit we'll hit done we'll have that in a turn and over here by the way you can see the festron are in a straight up battle against the navigators right now they are invading this world 
Now let's jump over to our summary tab. We can see that it goes us, Terrans with a massive lead, then the Torians, then the Altarans, then the Festron, then the Navigators. So the Festron are slightly more powerful than the Navigators. And what this is telling us is given time, the Festron will probably completely subsume the Navigators, gaining the worlds, growing much more powerful. So listen, ultimately, the Altarians really need to deal with the Festron. If, if they were smart, they'd pair up with the Navigators. If not, the Festron may become the preeminent power in their sector, um, which is fine. We'll see. Um, I see we're closing in on a prestige victory here. I mean, I'm sure we're, you know, ways out, but at 60%, yeah, we're over the hump. Um, and no one else is going to be able to keep up with us. The Altarians are the second closest. But um, yeah, at this point, we're probably going to run away with a prestige victory. So what else do we have to do? We got a few more modules. Um, we'll jump into the rest of these uh, mining stations here. Oh, we'll, here. We'll do one right now. There you go. Perimeter scanner, boom. Sector scanner, boom. Surveillance system, boom. Okay. Um, idle shipyard, Kratos 1. What do we want? We want a, a bunch more production modules. We'll throw those in the queue. Another shipyard idle. This is idle, Alula Borealis 2. Let's do some supply ships. We know we're gonna have a new colony world real quick and those supply ships will be handy for getting it built up quickly. And in fact, we can send them in right now. There is a Lula Borealis one. And we have a little uh, event for the, the founding the planet. Powerful drug. The flowers of a special plant on a Lula Borealis one are a powerful intoxicant. The drug provides an intense feeling of contentment to all those who consume it. Although in a few cases, people have been content to walk directly into powerful machinery. What are your orders? That is awesome. And actually, that is a really, really pretty little flower uh, graphic down there. So put in railings and let people use the drug recreationally. So this would tie in with our individualistic cultural awareness. Um, and it gives plus 10 approval on the planet only, not on all worlds, FYI. Make the drug illegal. So... or. Uh, make it illegal, but begin research efforts to find market uses for it. So this would be egalitarian leaning. It would increase crime. We don't want that. And it would yield plus 20 gross income on this world. And then finally, content workers or hard workers, give them more of the drug. So this is interesting to increase nihilism. But then I can see the defect right below a plus one to egalitarianism trait discount. So Clearly, it's it's meant to be one or the other. It's supposed to be uh, nihilism, not egalitarianism, I think. Uh, plus 10 to manufacturing, plus 10 to approval, minus 25% to growth. Wow, that is, that's heavy. That's heavy, folks. <laughs> uh, the approval in the manufacturing are good, but I, I think this is probably our best bet. I'll take the approval and I'll take another pip into individu individualism. Um, remember, culture is one of the hardest things to harvest in this game. It's the slowest growing of any of your stats. So the more we focus down on where we put our ideological discounts, the better off we are. Uh, we should double check there real quick. What's our number two? I think it was maybe uh, progressivism. Scrolling through. Traditionalism's at a nine. Progressivism's at an eight. Pacifism's at an 11. Nihilism or not. Is it nihilism? Nil. Nih. Nihil nihilism. Is it a one? And collectivism is at a three. So yeah, we want to stay on top of uh, pacifism, progressivism, traditionalism, if we're going to be into those at all. So advance the turn. We have a supply ship. Fantastic. And another supply ship. I want to start sending these guys over to Alula Borealis 1. But let's just check real quick and see if anyone here in particular needs help. Yeah, we do. Here, uh, let's help with the Infinite Garden. Um, I believe Infinite Garden is a... Oh, it's just a civilization achievement, not a galactic. Okay, Th that's fine. Th they can take some time for that. But here, let's send this supply ship streaming over to Alula Borealis 1. Let's jump into our leaders tab. And we'll do a quick scan. Um, we don't have a whole lot of money, so probably we don't want to hire anyone new. I'm just going to look through. Increases individualism ideology. That's not bad. Wouldn't be a bad person to have in our ranks. They have decent research, high social, high diligence. What else do we got? 
identical twin, crippling drug addiction, you know how it is. Raised by squatters, uh, does not forgive easily, and a void drifter, fantastic. Um, out of all these, uh, Carolyn's the only one that would make a good governor. And she'd make a decent governor. I like increases individualism ideology. Why? Because if we ever go back into our cultural tree, oh, nope, uh, cultural tree, we jump up to individualism and we get competitiveness, all citizens who have the individual trait will get a plus one raw to the core world. So we probably do want to actually hire her in lieu of putting Tila, sorry, Ta Tali in charge. Because ultimately, Tali doesn't, she would increase individualism awareness? Whoa. Whoa. She also increases individualism awareness? Oh, shit. What, what am I missing here? Oh. Increases individualism ideology. Increases individualism ideology awareness. I don't know what the difference is. Oh, shoot. It's given me an idea, though. It's given me an idea. What if... We're, we've been looking at our governors in terms of their stats. But is it worth our time to promote individualism on our worlds? So, for instance, here uh, you can see D.L. Bradley increases progressivism. Okay, well, that's not bad, but is that something we really, really want? I don't know. Um, I would rather have uh, individualism. Uh, no one else is going to have any sort of great effect for us. No, and here is loyalty, approval. Okay, cool. Um, let's jump back over. I feel like we should switch these two in, folks. Let's hire her. Let's make her the uh, governor of Alula. And then let's take Tali, who we, we've talked about would make an excellent governor. Let's jump in and let's sack somebody. We've been talking about sacking Jenna forever. God dang, she's super loyal. Holy crap. 109? How is that possible? <laughs> I, I wonder if that gives us extra bonuses for how freaking loyal she is. My God, that's high. Is there anyone else that would be? They're all. Yeah, it's all. It's all questionable. It's all questionable. Um, I'm just scanning real quickly. These two are pretty similar. Oh no, we we just placed her. Hold on. <laughs> uh, here. Yeah, we could do that. Um, I mean, listen, Sarah here is only is not particularly loyal anyway. Nor is Kari. The, the both of these are not particularly well suited. Neither is bad. Kari has a lower loyalty though, but she has one more diligence. I, I think one of these two should be the ones we replace. So that being said, Kratos Four is the more important world. So let's do it. Let's let's fire Kari, and let's drop in Tali. And let's reward Tali right now. We want to drive up that loyalty. We've already driven up the and right there. Carolyn as well. So we're trying to get all of our governors into the green. Obviously, it's good. Um, and then, yeah, let's take um, Kari here. And we'll move her over. And we'll drop her into the media position. Yeah, what the heck. There you go. Good enough for now. And let's look at... Oh, you know what? We're at about an hour and 15. Let's call that good. But... Um, on our next session, we will look at Alula Borealis and get the world set up. We'll start diverting supply ships there to help develop it as quickly as we can. And uh, yeah, otherwise, uh, let's also take a look at our trade routes in the coming game as all those freighter ships start completing the trade routes. I think we'll be up to about 10 of 10 licenses by the time that takes place. And as I zoom out here, you'll notice a whole smattering of anomalies everywhere. We can have all of our flagships jump back on top of surveying this new this new harvest of anomalies. So we will we will hoover them up as quick as we can, folks. All right, that's it. If you watched, thank you so much, and um, I'll see you next week.